In our discussion so far, we've looked at the authority of Scripture. We're going to look at the clarity of Scripture and the sufficiency of Scripture. But I wanted to interject something here in between those studies, and that is a session on the canon of Scripture. Uh, canon is a, is a fascinating topic, and I should probably say right from the outset uh, what kind of canon we're talking about. Uh, this is canon with one N, uh, not two Ns. That's the thing that you know goes boom. Uh, this is canon with one N, and uh, it's a Greek word actually comes directly from the Greek into the English, and the word literally means measuring rod. And our discussion here, we're talking about what particular books of the Bible constitute the biblical canon. Now, uh, from time to time, uh, I'll get a, a call in my office. I think people, you know, if they have a theological question, they go to the yellow pages and they see Bible college and they think, oh, well, they'll have the answers and so they call. And uh, if I happen to be sitting in my office, and I, I'm not stretching this, I've received this call three times. And the call goes something like this. Uh, I grew up Catholic and attended a, a Catholic church, and I have uh, become born again, and uh, I'm now in an evangelical church, and I have a very troubling question to ask you. Uh, why is your Bible smaller? Uh, that's the question I get. Uh, what happened to these books? You just took them out, right? And, and I love that question because it's a very easy answer. And I love questions that have easy answers. But the answer to that question is, no, we didn't take them out. See? In point of fact, those books were added much later. And uh, we'll get into that uh, down the road in the session a little bit. But it's a question that people have. Uh, you might remember this. I'm so glad this phenomenon has passed off the scene. But remember when everybody was infatuated with the Da Vinci Code. You, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing a paperback copy of the Da Vinci Code. And then it was the movie. Well. One of the, well, many of the errors that come out of the Da Vinci Code, but one of those many errors is the idea that a church council just settled, picked out of the sky the books that were in the Bible, and settled the question of canon. In fact, the book claims that the canon question was settled at the Council of Nicaea in 325. And that actually isn't true at all. Uh, in reality, actually, there was a council that discussed the canon, and it was much later. It was actually in the 390s that we see it, not 325. But, but what's the erroneous part, more than just the particular council that the author of the Da Vinci Code got wrong, is the idea that there were all these books equally valid, uh, equally authoritative in the church, and a council just simply picked the ones they wanted and left the rest off. It's just not true. But it's also not true that, and I, I think sometimes uh, some Christians may have this idea, that John finished writing Revelation, you know, sometime there around 90 A.D., and uh, even though Revelation appears last in the Bible, it also is likely the last of the biblical books written chronologically. That as John finishes writing Revelation, there plopping out of the sky is a nice leather-bound and black, burgundy, purple, pink, 66 books of the Bible. Uh, somewhere between that and all of these ideas out there, erroneous ideas of the canon, somewhere in between lies the truth. So let's see if we can get at it. Uh, first thing we've got to establish off the bat is what do we mean by canon? Now, as Protestants, we think a little differently about this issue than is thought of in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, in Roman Catholicism, the idea of 
the church's role in the process of canon is understood as the church establishing what is in fact the canon. And as Protestants, we substitute a word for establishing. Uh, the word that we prefer to explain this process is the word recognize. That the church, the process of canonization, is the process of the church recognizing what books are indeed in and what books are out. Now that is a world of difference between the term recognize and the term establish, isn't it? It's not just a semantic difference. It is, in fact, a substantive difference. Well, let's look at this process of recognition. I told you it's somewhere in between the Bible plopping out of the sky in 90 AD and, and church councils in the fourth century. So let's get a handle on it. First, we have to look, and we'll separate out the Old Testament, the 39 books of the Old Testament, from the 27 books of the New. The Old Testament, if we start, and where we really need to start here is Scripture itself. And one of the things we see is Scripture's own self-reflection on it as canon. Right? Uh, we see this in Joshua. Uh, right there at the onset of the historical books, there is the reference to the book of the law. And not just some vague, opaque reference. This is to be followed. This is to be at the center of Israel's life. And for you, Joshua, this is to be at the center of your life. So right from the beginning, there we have the first five books, the Pentateuch, the book of the law. And you've read these books, there's a lot of chapters and a lot of verses. That's a big chunk of text, isn't it? But even as we move through the Old Testament, it continues to reflect on itself. The prophets are constantly relying back on the Pentateuch, on the law. In fact, that's essentially what the prophets are doing. They're pointing back to the covenant. And then they're pointing to Israel and the present moment. And they're saying, this doesn't line up. You're not keeping covenant. You're not following what God has laid down for you to follow. So the prophets are consistently dependent upon the Pentateuch. As we move into the New Testament, we, we saw this earlier. We see it in, in the way Christ at one point uh, quotes from the Proverbs. And when he quotes from the Proverbs, he introduces it as saying, God says, and he's quoting from the Proverbs. So there is a reference to uh, the book of Proverbs and recognizing it as scripture. The famous text, of course, here is Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the disciples. And uh, while he is on the road to Emmaus, he is referring back uh, to the law and the prophets. In fact, he mentions that twice. Uh, in this time. So we see this even on the road to Emmaus as Christ is there with the disciples in Luke chapter 24. And as we come to this, it says in verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He says again over in verse 44, these are my words that I have spoken while I was still with you that everything about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, what Jesus is referring to there are the three sections of the Hebrew Bible. Ah, in fact, the, the Hebrew Bible is uh, referred to as the Tanakh. Uh, the Tanakh is actually an invented word, and it represents the three sections of the Old Testament. The T, of course, stands for the Torah, which is the law. The N stands for the Nebi'im, which is the Hebrew word for the prophets. And the KH is that great guttural sound. You know, you have to be careful when you say this word. You don't want anybody sitting uh, too, too, much, uh, too close in front of you. 
but this is ketavim, which is the writings. And so these three are put together and creates a word with the vowels added, the Tanakh. So when Jesus is talking about, and mostly in the New Testament, we have the law and the prophets as a reference to the whole Old Testament, but every once in a while you see law, prophets, and writings, or law, prophets, and psalms. Now what we don't have, while the New Testament refers to this, and the New Testament quotes from these Old Testament books, and it doesn't say, you know, Isaiah says, or Solomon says in Proverbs, it says God says, or Scripture says, what we don't have is a list. We don't have an actual list of 39 books. And one of the heresies that started up in the early church was a heresy that was sort of rooted in the Greek philosophy of Plato's that matter is bad. So part of this heresy began to see that the Old Testament is a pretty earthy book. It spends a lot of time talking about earthy matters, right? And God's word is, is more mystical. God's word is more mystical. God's word transcends the physical and the earthly. Right? So we began to cut out books of the Old Testament. In fact, one of these figures, uh, a heretic by the name of Marcion, produces what is sometimes called Marcion's Canon. And in that, he takes a swipe at these Old Testament books as not being authentic revelation, not authentic books of the Bible because of their content. So now the church has to respond to that heresy. And in fact, just as an aside, it's one of the things we see in the early church. The heresies were actually helpful to the church because they had a way of sort of spurring the church on to develop its doctrine. To, to firm up and secure its doctrine. We see that in terms of Christology, and we also see that in terms of canon. And so, in response to Marcion, he's around the 150s. You know, we don't, we don't always know when these folks are born. That's because of Hallmark. Now we know when people are born. But before Hallmark, we didn't always keep track of birth dates. But we're circa the 150s. And in response to that, the Bishop of Sardis, Melito, and 170 issues the canon list of the Old Testament, of the 39 books of the Old Testament, that uh, the church then recognizes as constituting the Old Testament. There was this general idea of the law, prophets, and writings, but again, there wasn't this specific list, and it was spurred on by this heresy of Marcion. Well, let's turn to the New Testament. This is a bit more of a complicated issue and a bit more of an involved process. There are some uh, touchstones along the way as we try to understand this process of, and again, remember our key word here, uh, recognition. And one of those touchstones along the way is a great document from uh, 140 that we call the Muratorian Fragment. Now, it's called a fragment because it is, in fact, a fragment. Uh, uh, this is very scholarly. Isn't it? The uh, beginning is lost and the ending is lost, hence it's a fragment. And it's called Muratorian because it's named after the Italian archaeologist who discovered it. Uh, his name, and with a name like this, he had to achieve greatness in his life. Ludovico Antonio Muratori. Isn't that a great name? Don't you just love that name? Around the 1720s, he made this discovery of the Muratorian fragment. Now, we don't know who produced it. Uh, we don't know, but we have a general sense that it was widely accepted and circulated within the church or that it was uh, reflective of widely held views. But we don't know a whole lot of details 
about the Muratorian fragment. But what this document gives us is sometimes what we refer to as the Muratorian canon. And it gives us some insight into the process and it also shows us where we are in the process. Now, to back up from the Muratorian fragment, we could even go back to the New Testament itself. And in the New Testament itself, we see Paul, right, in 1 Corinthians where he's giving the, the, um, uh, the, the regulations regarding the Lord's Supper to the Corinthian church. What does he do? He quotes the Gospels. Right? And throughout the epistles, there is the reference back to the Gospels. So, so we know we have the four Gospels. And that's a big chunk of the New Testament when you stop and think about it. Uh, we have that text in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, where 2 Peter takes the epistles of Paul and calls them Scripture. The epistles of Paul form a big chunk of the New Testament. So the New Testament's own reflection on ourself shows that there's a pretty good core there. And as we go into the uh, 90 to 140, the era before the Muratorian fragment and after the writing of the New Testament in that early era, what we see is in these bishops' writings like the Bishop of Polycarp or the other bishops, what we see in these bishop, bishops' writings is a reference to various biblical books of the New Testament, quoting them for authority. And so the general consensus is that by roughly 100 AD, we had the four Gospels, we had Paul, the letters of Paul, and the book of Acts, and some of the general epistles. If we could put percentages on it, we're 85% there by 100 AD. Now what happens next, as we look through this, is to show that there was some fuzzy boundaries in those early centuries of the church. Uh, not so much because God wanted his people to be, out, be without his word, but because there were, in fact, other voices present in the church. Now, we have to say this right off the bat. Uh, there's a, a, a very popular writer these days, it's sort of the go-to man among the networks when they want to talk about the New Testament times, Bart Ehrman. Uh, Bart Ehrman is a, a very well-credentialed scholar of the New Testament, and Ehrman has a thesis that essentially boils down to this, the mere presence of other voices in the early centuries of the church legitimate those voices. And somewhat akin to the argument of the Da Vinci Code, in those councils in the fourth century, the particular voice, the voice that we call orthodoxy, emerged as the winner. Now that view does not do justice to the data. For instance, most of these books that were debated were these spurious gospels. You've heard of them. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas. These weren't unknown to the church fathers. In fact, Irenaeus, one of the ones who was right in there at the beginning battling for uh, orthodox Christology, speaks clearly of aware of the presence of the Gospel of Judas, but he says there are four Gospels. Now, I don't know if this is necessarily a good argument, but this is the argument he made. There, are four, there has to be four Gospels because there are four directions. There's north, south, east, and west, therefore there has to be four Gospels. Now, I'm not sure that's the most airtight logic, but we can set his argument aside. What we have there is his view. And his view is, oh yes, there are these other takes on Jesus, but we don't recognize them. We don't recognize them. But at pockets of the church, right, and this is before the creeds, this is before Nicene Creed and Chalcedonian Creed, in pockets of the church, these gospels were present. And there were other books claiming to be written by the apostles. There was uh, the Apocalypse of Peter, well, John had epistles, and John had an apocalypse, so Peter should have an apocalypse too. Don't you think that's fair? It's only fair for Peter. So there was a book called The Apocalypse of Peter. 
that some in the church accepted, but never widely accepted. So these are the types of issues that are being dealt with in the 100s and the 200s. 85% solid fuzzy boundaries. And these fuzzy boundaries aren't legitimating these books or aren't undermining the process. They just simply were present. As we look into the Muratorian fragment, not only is it insightful for its list, but it's also insightful because it tells us the criteria the church was working off of as it engaged this issue of recognizing the canon. And three criteria emerge. One is authorship. The book had to be written by an apostle. Now, that's twofold reason. One is the apostles were eyewitnesses. And uh, even in our courts of law today, right, hearsay evidence is ruled out. Uh, eyewitness evidence, see, that matters. And multiple eyewitness evidence matters even more. So the apostles were eyewitnesses. But secondly, and more importantly, the apostles had the authority of the office. They spoke from God. As the prophets spoke from God, the apostles spoke from God. So authorship, apostolic authorship. For instance, Muratorian Fragment mentions the book, The Shepherd of Hermes. And it says, this book is a helpful book. Christians should read it. But it also says, it shouldn't be read aloud in the church, meaning when the scripture is read aloud, right? Because they didn't want to confuse it as scripture. Because we know the author, and he's of our own day. See? So it's clearly showing authorship as a criteria. The second one is content. Content. Does it measure up to a theological content? Does it contradict other books, or does it uh, work in concert with those other books? And so the Muratorian Fragment mentions some of these Gnostic texts that have become very popular in the wake of the Da Vinci Code and the arguments of people like Bart Ehrman, the Gospels of Thomas and of Judas, etc. And it says, it is not fitting that these books be mixed with scripture as honey should not be mixed with gall. Now, I've never had gall. I've had honey. I've never had gall. I understand gall is bitter. <laughs> not all that pleasant. And honey is. Okay. Content. And then thirdly, and this seems circular, but acceptance. So you're saying, okay, now this is circular. Books are accepted because they are accepted. Right. Say. And that shows us. The church isn't lending credibility to these things. It's certainly not establishing the canon. But it's also not even lending credibility when it meets in councils and writes up lists. All the church is doing is recognizing the authority that those books have. They're accepted as canon because they're accepted as canon. We're recognizing what is. Well. Athanasius, in 367, as a bishop, writes an Easter letter to the churches. And in his Easter letter of 367, sometimes it's called the Paschal letter, P-A-S-C-H-A-L, for that time of the suffering of Christ, the Paschal Lamb, 367 gives us a list of the 27 books of the New Testament. In the 390s, at 397, at the Synod of Carthage, the church agrees to this list, recognizing the 27 books of the New Testament. So we have the Melito of Sardis in 170, and from 360 to 390, the New Testament, as the church is recognizing what is indeed the Word of God. And that's the process of canonization. And our next time together, we're going to ask the question, how do we interpret these 66 books? And we'll take a quick look at interpretation.